Quranic recitation from my former student Adil here. MashaAllah, he's a half of the Quran, beautiful recitation, MashaAllah, Allahumma Barak. So we'll start with Adil and then uh, we'll get our presentation started, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين جعلوا القرآن عضين فوربك لنسألنهم أجمعين عما كانوا يعملون فاصنع بما تؤمر وأعرض عن المشركين إنا كفيناك المستهزئين الذين يجعلون مع الله إلها آخر فسوف تعلمون ولقد نعلم أنما يضيق صدرك بما يقولون فسبح بحمد ربك وكن من الساجدين وعبد ربك حتى يأتيك اليقين صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خير عدل إن ما شاء الله I didn't tell him to recite those verses but that kind of plays into what I'm going to talk about today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times in the Quran asks the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to be patient and that's one of the things that's very important in making connections. So my name is Hasib Sadat. I'm a private teacher. Um, I spent some years as a vice principal, uh, most recently at Granada Islamic School. Before that, I was at North Star as a teacher. And right now, I'm like in education consulting, and I do private teaching for mostly Muslim homeschooling co-ops. So this is something that I wish I had known very early on in my teaching career. Um, the reality of the situation is when it comes to teaching, your technical skills and your knowledge pale little in comparison to the connection and relationship you build with your students. So you can extrapolate from the classroom. This could be for your family, this could be at work, it could be in any social setting. And you guys all know this. The connections we form are the things that really give us fulfillment. Uh, propel us, uh, make sure our influence is, is known and understood and widespread. So that's the topic for today. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. First, I'll get into kind of what social psychology says. And then what, I'm, what I really love and I really appreciate is seeing everything from a Quran and Sunnah worldview. And um, when I was at Davis and whatever subject that I'd be studying, whether it be psychology or biology or whatever the, the subject matter was, if you had just a little bit of Qur'an and Sunnah in your background, it just made things so amazing. So anytime I studied like um, social psychology or behavioral psychology, and then you see what best practices are, and then you see the Prophet ﷺ doing those things, it's just like, man, it just like reaffirms your faith. It doesn't prove the faith, but it reaffirms it. Man, my Prophet ﷺ did this 1400 years ago, and now social psychologists are saying, to do X, Y, and Z. And it's just reaffirming all the beloved things that our Prophet taught us. Whether that be smiling or turning directly to the person you're speaking to. And all these things are so, so important when you're making connections. So I was first told by one of my beloved teachers, like, when you first start, this is my first year of teaching. When you first start, he said, Asib, make sure that you're tough with them. Make sure that you're stern with them. Don't let them run all over you. Don't let them walk all over you. And I know the advice was well-intentioned. But really everything that social psychology shows us today about teaching, that's not really the right approach. And we're gonna get into that, but before we do, I wanna ask the audience, and maybe some of the kids, this is fresh for you guys, who were some of your favorite teachers? And not just who were they, why were they your favorite teachers? And as you guys are thinking, I want some hands up, because I want you guys to like actually tell me who the teacher was and why he or she was one of your favorite teachers. So go ahead, I want you guys to think. And as you guys are thinking, I'm going to just list off some of my teachers. In kindergarten, Mrs. Johnson. Fourth grade, Mrs. Smith. Fifth grade, Mrs. Anderson. In eighth grade, Mrs. Shopta. I'm skipping some years, as you can, can see, because not everybody was your favorite teacher. In high school, I had, oh, I forgot Mr. Spinola, my PE teacher in middle school, I probably my favorite 
You know, he used to like make fun of me and tease me. Sound like him, boys. He used to make fun of me and tease me and give me a hard time, but I loved him so much. Wallahi, I would like do anything for this man. He wasn't even Muslim, right? None of these people I'm mentioning are Muslim, by the way. Just really good people. Uh, Mrs. Breed, my Spanish teacher. Uh, Mrs. Sitkin. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Frasca. These are all high school teachers. Mr. Johansson. Right? So there's even, oh, and my wrestling coaches. I wrestled in high school. Coach Josh, Coach Ron. Coach Ron was like a second father to me. Not, not Muslim. Didn't, we didn't really share any of the same philosophical values, but he connected with me on such uh, a level I can't even describe. And it's dangerous too, right? Because sometimes the people that connect with our children, with us, they're not good influences. So he had his own, you know, b uh, battles that he would deal with. And he wasn't like the most um, cultured individual, but he taught me toughness and how to be a man and be strong. Uh, you know, he, he served like as a second father. My dad was more like meek and gentle and Coach Ron was like really tough. Okay, now you guys, please raise your hand. Give me a name and a teacher. Why that teacher was your favorite? Can anybody tell me? Zaid, would you like to start? One of your favorite teachers and maybe why? I'll repeat whatever you say so they can hear you. His HIFS teacher, Sheikh Hamza, and why, why did he, you remember him? Or why did he, does he stand out? Patience, okay. Anybody else? Yes. Mm. Okay, great. So sixth grade teacher, and he was stern and hard, but at the same time kind, and you still learn from him. Okay, kindness is a big factor. Anybody else? Two more? No? Adul. Give me a teacher and why do you, why you remember him or her? He's uh, in college now, maybe a professor. I, I think uh, one teacher that I'll probably remember for my life is Sheikh Fardin. Mm -hmm. And I think the main reason for that is because beyond just being a teacher, he also built a relationship outside of the classroom. And he's uh, given me a lot of guidance throughout my life. Allahu Akbar, okay. Going out of your way and building connections is never easy. It is never easy. You got to go out of your way when everybody else is, all the other teachers are grading work. Maybe you're outside in recess connecting with your students. And Sheikh Fardin, by the way, one of my favorites, he's like my fifth cousin. Did you know that? I don't know. I don't, I, we're, our families are from the same village in Afghanistan. And so he's like somehow related to me somehow. So if he's watching this, we love you, Sheikh Fardin. Okay, so th that's just an example. So there are certain things that leave an indelible mark. I would say... The bit, I don't even remember what my teachers taught me. I really don't remember. What I remember is how they made me feel. I think this is a Maya Angelou quote. Nobody remembers you for what you do or what you say. They remember you for how you made them feel. Please, guys, soak that. All those trips you're taking your kids on and Disneyland and, uh, you know, Dubai theme parks and <clears throat> Eid, giving gifts is good, right? Call the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tahadu tahabu. You give gifts, it builds love. I'm not saying don't give gifts, but what I'm saying is ultimately we've seen examples of like really well-to-do families. They give their kids everything, cars and whatever, money and presents, and there's no relationship at the end of the day. They become adults and they stray. Okay, so I would say the biggest thing is how you make your children feel, how you make your students feel, your coworkers feel, and anybody that comes into your sphere of influence. Okay, moving on. Oh, I've got my clicker here. Okay, and I, I would say that was my biggest strength as a teacher. Even to this day, it's not even really the technical skills. Alhamdulillah, that comes as you build uh, yourself and your competency, but it was really just me connecting with my students. And I was, I was kind of a natural at that. And so everywhere I went, I still talk to some of my students today, like Brother Mansoor's nephews, uh, Hamza and um, Bilal, I taught them at North Star. To this day, I still, when I see them, it's like as if we, we do, we've never spent time apart. We go back to what, what it was like in, uh, when we were in middle school. And uh, the oldest son is in Santa Cruz, the other one's in high school. So we still have these connections today. And what does social psychology say? There's so much evidence and studies. I'm not just talking uh, from a non-scientific point of view. Um, so when you have um, healthy relationships in class, kids learn better. You guys know Maslow's hierarchy of needs? When they feel safe and secure, and they feel like there's a space for them, that's when a student can begin to develop themselves. Same at home. If your child feels safe and secure, 
they can start to grow and flourish and develop. I remember this one study we learned in a psychology class at Davis, very famous study, I forgot the exact name of um, the, the conductors of the study, but they took different monkeys, chimps. They have a very sophisticated social network and whatnot. Um, a lot of similarities to how us as humans, we conduct our relationships. So these baby chimps, there was three different scenarios. One scenario was when there was a, a present mother. The mother would hold the child, caress the child, feed the child. Then there was a second scenario in which that chimp, that baby chimp, was with a robotic mother. And that robotic mother didn't move. It just had a pouch for milk, and the baby would curl up and sleep inside of its lap. It was like a steel metal uh, fake mother. The last example was a chimp that didn't have any physical presence or touch or any other type of social uh, uh, interaction. So as you can imagine, when they put these chimps as teenagers into social settings, the one chimp that didn't have any social interactions fought with everybody, became depressed, was in corners, started ripping out its fur, all these really deviant behaviors just by not just by uh, lacking a physical touch and a presence. So subhanAllah, just imagine, imagine with our uh, complexities as human beings, what that lack of touch and sensitivity can do to us. There's also been studies about like um, the oxytocin release that kids get when they're with a teacher or a parent that they can trust. It's good for their brain development and just overall social skills and, 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 and overall cues. So, subhanAllah, there's so many benefits um, from building relationships. It's the most, to me, the most important thing that any teacher or parent or colleague can do because it's optimal for relationships and optimal for learning and growing. Now, there's many things as a teacher that you're taught to do. So when your kids come into the room, you greet them, you ask them how they're doing, you talk about uh, things that they like, right? So much of connecting with people is about what other people like. So these are the practical actions you know, like one thing that I've been trying to practice with my daughters when they come home from school, I notice that when I say, I tell Zainab, my uh, second grader, or sometimes Asiya, my, my uh, pre-K uh, daughter, I tell them, like, I used to tell them, what did you do at school? What did you learn? And quite often, they wouldn't say anything. You know, for whatever reason, they can talk their head off, but when it comes to, what did you do at school? It was like, I don't want to talk about it, or I'm not interested, whatever. So then I, start, I, I, saw this, um, I saw this video in which um, there was like an expert parenting um, guide and he said, why don't you ask your kids who they helped at school? Especially for girls because they're very social. So I started doing that and made a world of difference. So I started connecting better with my own daughters just by implementing some simple step like that. There's all these little things that you can do and um, you'll see as we move along this presentation how the Prophet ﷺ incorporated many of these things. He gave the Sahaba a voice. He gave his family his undivided time and attention, even though he was so busy and overwhelmed. He really was overwhelmed to the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed verses not to kill yourself over these things. Right? So subhanAllah. I want to mention a, a, um, um, a recent a video I saw of a UFC fighter. And he's supposed to be a really tough, tough individual. And he talked about how when he was in middle and high school, he was very misunderstood. He had a very abusive father. Uh, his mother wasn't the best, you know, influence. She had her own kind of demons she was battling. And so he had a lot of problems at home. And to the point where he couldn't go to sleep, he had anxiety. He even to the point where he would pick out his gums until it started bleeding. That was one of his coping mechanisms. So when he would go to school, he would always fall asleep. And guess how the teacher reacted? How do you guys think the teacher reacted? Not very kind, right? What do you think the teacher said? Blame him, right? And that's what he said. He said he was labeled as the bad kid. Had one of his teachers pull him aside and say, hey, what's going on? Anything you want to talk to me about? How can I help you? Instead of saying, get up, you're lazy. What are you doing? You're so disrespectful. So there's a lot of things like this that happen on a daily basis. Just from our lack of awareness, the Prophet wasallam rarely, rarely outside of Abbas wa Tawalla, when the blind man came to him, rarely did he ever make any social miscues. Like one time a blind, the blind man, Ibn Umm Maktoum, radiallahu anhu, came to him and um, 
he was really busy. The Prophet was really busy with the, the leaders of Quraysh. He was trying to give them da'wah to call them to Islam. The Prophet knew if he had the leaders come to Islam, then everybody else would follow. So Ibn Umm Maktoum came to him in a very sincere way, wanting to learn about Islam. He was already a Muslim, by the way. So the Prophet kind of like brushed him off. Like, hold on a second. Like, I'm talking to some nobleman here. Hold on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't like that. That's one of the very few mistakes, I would say. The Prophet didn't sin. One of the few mistakes our Prophet ﷺ made is Allah didn't like the fact that he, just because of their nobility, chose the aristocrats of Quraysh, of Mecca, over this sincere, older, uh, no-status individual, really. Right? He was seen as kind of like the lower class of Meccans. But in Allah's eyes, he was not the lower class. Right? Okay. So let's move on. I want to talk about from a Quranic paradigm, from the, the evidences that we get from the Quran and Sunnah. And whenever you guys get a speaker to talk to you about Islam, if there's a lack of Quran and Sunnah, you know, ask about it. Because I think that's one of the biggest things that we can do as Muslims is go back to the books that we know. And there should be another talk. Inshallah, I'll, I'll recommend to Brother Khalid. What are the evidences of the Quran? Such, there's so many beautiful talks about why, we don't just blindly follow the Qur'an but there's so many amazing evidences as to why the Qur'an is 100% the verbatim word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so I'm using this in my presentation, it's the best evidence that we have Uh oh, I think my thing turned off, here we go Okay, so we'll go at the first verse and I'll have Adl recite these beautiful ayat, mashallah, and we'll talk about it فَبِمَا فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ فَاعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ الله أكبر الله مبارك So guys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is warning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's saying, had you been harsh, and we're talking about the greatest human being to ever set foot on this earth. If you had been harsh, the people around you, the Sahaba, would have turned away from you. So imagine us. Who are we compared to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So if Allah is reprimanding, and these guys, the, the ayat that I chose, there's many ayat that talk about connection. With, with other human beings, right? Even with other animals. There's many ayat I could have chosen, but these are explicit, not implied. These are explicit Quranic verses that talk about the importance of connection with other people. So had you been cruel and harsh with them, they would have turned away. All right, next verse. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ So... That just lets you know, whatever the Prophet ﷺ does, his default usually was mercy. His default usually was mercy to the point where one of his best friends and companions, Sayyidina Umar anhu, there was even an incident that was mentioned in the seerah how the Prophet, uh, Sayyidina Umar was very upset with how merciful the Prophet ﷺ was being towards certain people that were, were sinning, let's just say that. Because they're Sahaba, we respect them. And the Prophet ﷺ said that I was given a choice by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I chose mercy. Sayyidina Umar was that kind of a sahabi and he had a different leadership style where he was ready to cut off heads if you disrespect Allah and his Prophet. But the Prophet was, he was on the side of mercy. I think even though both leadership styles are valid, right, the default is always the Prophet ﷺ. He's the best. So we want to do what's the best. There is revenge in Islam, by the way. But quite often the Prophet, if not 99% of the time, would choose pardon and forgiveness and mercy. But there is revenge in Islam. It's a valid response to certain things that happen to us. But what would our Prophet choose? And that's always the best. So subhanAllah, what he does, we should implement. Next verse. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرُجُ اللَّهِ لِمَا كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرُ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Again, the Prophet is our best example. Let's do the things that our beloved Prophet ﷺ does. Couple more ayat. 
محمد رسول الله والذين معه أشداء على الكفار على الكفار رحماء بينهم سبحان الله then there is a distinction to be made amongst the believers, amongst the Muslims. There is a special rahma that we treat that we treat each other with, and we are more straightforward with the kuffar. And even in the beginning, in the beginning, before you're considered a kafir, one who rejects the blessings of Allah, rejects the truth of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, even Musa alayhi salam was told to go to Fir'aun layinan, gently, softly, so that maybe he be, he might become humble. So. We try our best with the non-believers and the non-Muslims, and then if they show us that they have um, they have some type of negativity towards us, then you know we we save our special treatment and our special mercy for for the Muslims, and we treat everybody kindly. But in particular with the believers, as Allah instructed our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, one more ayah. I think we've established you these ayat that our Prophet was the absolute best example and now we're going to go into his life. So that was connections in the Quran. There's many more ayat. You guys can look it up inshallah. Now we'll get into his actual life. Subhanallah, his sahaba, his companions who we love, who we appreciate, who we, emu who we emulate. Radiallahu anhum ajma'een. There's so many things, so many stories to talk about, but I picked a few. One of the incidents was the story of Amr ibn al-As. Who was Amr ibn al-As? He was a staunch enemy of Islam. When the, when the uh, Sahaba and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went, um, well, not the Prophet, he sent the Sahaba to Abyssinia, to Habasha, to the king. Amr ibn al-As followed them and told the king, these people are bad people, they're gonna ruin your society. Amr ibn al-As, he fought against the Muslims in the Battle of Badr in, Hu in Uhud. Very smart, uh, very strategic, and he was a staunch enemy. When he came to Islam, his life changed. He came into Islam with Khalid ibn Walid as well. They both came as a package, mashallah. One of the biggest enemies of Islam became the biggest believer. So anyways, his interactions with the Prophet were so unique. At one point, he thought he was the most beloved Sahabi. At one point, he went from the most staunch enemy of the Prophet to thinking he was the favorite. So in a gathering, you know, to show his status, he stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, who was your favorite amongst your companions? So the Prophet wasallam he said, Aisha, his wife. So then Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu said, no, from the men, Ya Rasulullah, from the men, who's your favorite? Right, because he thinks he, it's, it's him. He said, Abuha, her father, Abu Bakr Siddiq, right? And then Amr was a little confused. He said, okay, then who? Then Umar, radiallahu anhu. Okay, then who? Uthman. The, the Rawi mentions, I forgot who narrated the hadith, but uh, he mentions that Amr ibn al-As was so shy to ask again because he felt that he wouldn't be included in the list. So he stopped asking the Prophet after that. But what's my point? My point is that he made everybody feel special. This was the default position of all the Sahaba, really. They thought they were the favorites. Especially those from the Sabiqun, from the Muhajirin and the Ansar who came to Islam first. They felt like they had a special connection with the Prophet ﷺ. So, subhanAllah, like the Sahaba were willing to risk their lives for the Prophet. His connection with them was so strong. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, who was one of the Ansar in Medina who converted to Islam after learning from Musa ibn Umair. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, they were talking about the battle of Uhud. And he wanted to get the opinion of the people of Medina. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh was one of the leaders of Medina. He goes to Sa'ad and said, what, what's your opinion on the matter? I'm going to paraphrase. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh says, Ya Rasulullah, whatever you say, we're going to do. If you march us into the, into the sea, we're going to go hand in hand with you. Subhanallah. The connection that you build with somebody that they're willing to run through a brick wall to sacrifice their lives. SubhanAllah, this is a sacrifice that's the ultimate. Then there was Talha ibn Ubaidullah. He was known as the walking shaheed. They say after Uhud, after he took so many strikes and arrows to shield the Prophet 
He had over 70 scars on him from battle. 70 scars. <sighs> these connections are rare. But if you do it right, like our prophet did, and we'll see how we made these connections as we move on to the story. The ultimate sacrifice you can make is your life, your wealth. His wife, Khadija, literally sacrificed to the point where the scholars mentioned that her death was because of the embargo that the Quraysh put on the, the Muslims early on because of lack of food and resources. Khadija passed away from an early death. And we know this is a death decreed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't say early, but it, it could have been, she sacrificed her life supporting her husband. How did the Prophet ﷺ treat the youth? One of, his, uh, one of his servants, Anas ibn Malik, he was a ghulam, he would always serve the Prophet ﷺ. And one time, he told Anas to go into the market and run an errand. As You guys all know these stories, I'm just reminding myself and you, and, and you guys. He ran into the market and he started playing amongst the young men, the boys. They were playing their game. Time went by, the Prophet was wondering, where is Anas? He goes to find him, and he sees him playing with the youth. How do you guys think the Prophet responded when he saw him? Do you know how he responded when he saw Anas? Any idea? SubhanAllah, he was happy. He smiled at Anas, and he understood that he forgot his task because he's a young boy. He wanted to play and have fun. So he understood with the youth how to connect with him on a deeper level. Then there's Tufail ibn Amr and his pet bird. SubhanAllah, he found out that Tufail had just lost his parakeet. I don't know what kind of bird they had, but it was like a small little bird. And Tufail was a young little boy, maybe three, four years old. The Prophet went out of his way to visit Tufail, just to ask, yeah, Tufail, how's your bird? How's your bird? And how happy would it make him that the Prophet of Allah, who's getting revelation from the Most High, is coming to ask about a little bird, right? And that culture, very rare. People wouldn't even kiss their kids in that culture. Now imagine him going out of his way to go ask about a dead bird. There was another youth, a teenager, who came to the Prophet ﷺ. And because there's youth here, I'm going to kind of crowd, or uh, I'm going to kind of uh, make this PG. He came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to do something that's haram with the opposite gender. Allow me to do something that's haram. So... But we'd expect this is the Messenger of Allah, right? And when Umar, Sayyidina Umar would hear these type of requests and ask, he would get really upset. The Prophet wasn't like that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, from a logical perspective, what you're asking for, would you like somebody to do that with your mother? May, may, may I be sacrificed for you, Ya Rasulullah? Of course not. How about your sister? No. How about your daughter? Of course not. How about your uh, ammat and your khalat? How about them? Of course not, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ then put his hand on, his beloved hand on the chest of the Sahabi, this youth, and made dua for him. He made dua for him. And the Rawi mentions in the hadith that this man, he didn't have any of these temptations from that day forth. So even the Prophet ﷺ, he would connect with people on a very logical level. Okay, so SubhanAllah, even with the youth, he was beautiful. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned, I forgot to move the slide, sorry guys. He mentioned that the best of you are the best of your families, i.e. wives and children, i.e. wives and children. So SubhanAllah, even with his wives, he would, when Khadija had passed away, he would send meat and any qurbani to the family of Khadija radiallahu anha. With his wife Aisha, when she would drink from a cup, he would drink from the same cup. And not only that, he would turn the cup so wherever she put her lip, he would put his lip as well. Just to show her just a beautiful love and affection. Right? Oftentimes, Hassan and Hussein would climb on his back while he was in sajda, his beloved uh, grandchildren. Radiallahu anhum. They would climb on his back and you know, this is, this is a place where the Prophet Sallallahu he would kiss his grandchildren and other Sahabi would say, Ya Rasulullah, you're kissing your grandchildren? Like, what are you doing? This is like a, a sign of weakness. And what did our Prophet respond with? He said, one who cannot show, uh, show mercy will not be shown mercy. One who cannot show mercy will not be shown mercy. 
So look at, he's shifting the entire culture of that time, in the time of Arabia, in Mecca and Medina, the Hijaz. How would he treat strangers, subhanAllah? This is amazing. Bedouins would come to the Prophet ﷺ and rip his shawl off his beloved neck to the point where there was a red mark. And this Bedouin, they're very straightforward, very, you know, kind of in your face kind of people. And he was a Muslim, by the way, this Bedouin. He just came into Islam. He said, uh, he said, oh, oh Muhammad, give me from the wealth of the Muslims. As he ripped his shawl off, his beautiful shawl that he got from Yemen. And so, how did the Prophet respond, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He didn't get mad. He smiled at the Bedouin and instructed his elder companions, give him some of the wealth. To the point where he would have whole flock of sheep he would give to strangers. SubhanAllah. And this is, this, these examples, to be honest, are way uh, above us, to, to be real. Right? Like imagine giving like three, four cars to random people and uh, hundreds if not thousands of dollars to people. It's... But the point is, he's a messenger of Allah, and we should strive. We should strive. Some of these things are very difficult to achieve. And then how about his enemies? SubhanAllah, this is like, it gets to another level. And I have to be honest with you guys, the more status you have, the more competency you have, the less you have to work to build strong connections. What do I mean by that? The Prophet had a very high status. So sometimes he would smile and people would look at his face and they would say, that is not the face of a, of a liar. And they would say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. It's hard to have that expectation of us. So we have to work harder, actually. The Prophet وسلم, after building on his own sincerity and striving and working, he built his status as a sadiq al amin before Nabuwa, before he became a prophet. And so everything that ensued. It was almost miraculous. If we're going to be real about this, it's, it was miraculous. And he had Allah's help. But like I said, we can strive. So when his enemies came, this is after Fath of Mecca, many of the people that came into Islam just kind of came begrudgingly because the Muslims had now conquered Mecca. So one of these was Fadala ibn Umar. He didn't like the Muslims, but he converted to Islam. And his plan was he was going to go around the Kaaba, follow the Prophet, and then take out his dagger and stab him. That was his plan. So Fadala has his knife, his dagger, like wrapped up in his cloak. The Prophet ﷺ, he's very observant. He, he noticed Fadala talking to himself. So he's making tawaf on the Kaaba and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he de deserves to be worshipped. And he goes to Fadala and says, Fadala, what's, what's the matter? You're talking to yourself. Everything okay? He said, no. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm fine. I'm just, uh, I'm remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet, he could see, he's observant, that something is wrong with Fadala. He put his hand, his beloved hand on his chest to make dua for him. And he said, Fadala is mentioning this hadith. He said, not even before he removed his hand, I went from his face being the most hated face in my eyes to his face being the most beloved face. And his plot to kill the Prophet وسلم, ended there. And we know other stories as well. Even Sayyidina Umar, he came to kill the Prophet. Not because he hated the Prophet وسلم, He came because this man is causing a lot of problems in Mecca. You know, Quraysh is about to like, have a civil war. He came to stop it. <laughs> and subhanAllah, you guys know this story. All right? It's a long story. Inshallah, maybe we get a whole talk on this story one day. But uh, he eventually came to the Prophet. The Prophet وسلم, he, he brought Umar down to his knees and basically said, what's the matter with you? Accept Islam. And Sayyidina Umar on that day accepted Islam after also hearing some ayat of Surah Taha. So, subhanAllah, very beautiful stories. Hind, Utbah, uh, um, Hind uh, bint Utbah, one of the leaders of Quraysh, her dad was killed in the battle. So, she wanted revenge in the battle of Uhud. Uh, they plotted to kill one of the Prophet's best friends, his cousin Hamza, Asadullah, radiallahu anhu. And she hated Islam, she hated the Muslims, she hated the Prophet ﷺ. After the Fath of Mecca, she became Muslim. Right? And so when she entered Islam begrudgingly, the Prophet ﷺ basically said, Oh Hind, welcome to, welcome to Islam. Welcome. We honor you. How did Hind respond? He said, before this, before you said that, you were the most hated man to me. And now that you've said that, all he wants to do is honor you and your family. 
So this kind of effects that he would have, and even Wahshi, the Abyssinian slave who ended up killing Hamza, even he came asking for forgiveness and became Muslim, and the Prophet ﷺ accepted him, even though it was hard for him to be around Wahshi, because he reminded him of his uncle Hamza radiallahu anhu, and you guys know, right, as they came even to Mecca, after coming back and all those years of persecution and uh, literally they would throw the intestines and guts of a camel on the Prophet ﷺ. They would harm him and his companions and starve them and do so many things. In Fath Mecca, they said, the Muslims said, Al -yawm, yawm al -malhama. Today is the day of revenge, of slaughtering. We're going to get our revenge back. And what did the Prophet respond with? Al -yawm, yawm al -marhama. Today, rather, is a day of mercy. And his default was always mercy. And with these connections, as you guys all know, Islam began to grow. The Hijaz became a formidable uh, place, you know, and slowly uh, Egypt was, was opened and Persia was opened and Rome was opened just all, from these connections. So now, what can we do, right? These are some things that uh, the Prophet, there's many things he did, but these are some practical things, like the one thing that is hard for us as adults sometimes to do is empathize with the youth, right? Empathizing with the youth. And uh, as a vice principal, you know, it'd be hard because sometimes kids would get labeled. This person's a troublemaker, uh, this person talks too much, and, you know, this person puts on too much makeup, and blah, 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 blah. So many things we say about our kids sometimes that we label them. And this is the wrong approach, being judgmental. And we will talk about mercy versus justice in a bit because this, this religion is not just mercy, mercy, mercy. No, there's limits and boundaries and all those beautiful things as well. But we have to empathize and see where is this coming from? Where are these behaviors coming from? Is there lack of food, lack of sleep, uh, not enough uh, uh, connection at home? So these things, even with our own kids, sometimes they might come back and they're talking back and they're yelling and um, they yell so you yell back because they, you, we think they deserve it. But the reality of the matter is, is the Prophet wasallam, the best example, he meant harshness with kindness. There was once a lady, there was once a lady who had just lost a beloved. Um, and the Prophet wasallam came to advise her because she was crying and screaming and re being really loud. So she said, leave me alone. Who are you to talk to me this way? Basically scolding the Prophet or uh, scolding the Prophet uh, wasallam. The Prophet, he walked away, didn't say anything back. This lady was told by a person who was standing nearby, do you know who that was? That was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She was shocked, she ran to the Prophet's house, knocked on his door and said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize what I was doing. I was just caught up in the moment. The Prophet he understood, he empathized. The Prophet himself lost three daughters, two sons, his beloved, he didn't, uh, his father, his mother, his uh, uncle, you know, there's so many people he lost in his life. He understood what death can do to a person. So he said to her some advice, that's it, and he kept it short. He said, the time of patience, the time you get rewarded for patience is at, uh, is at, the, pinnacle of, um, is at the pinnacle of calamity. That's the time you get rewarded for patience. And that's an advice that we have to this day. The Prophet ﷺ would listen. When he would talk to somebody, he would turn his full face. He would turn his full face to somebody. He would smile at people. These are things that we can implement right away. He wouldn't talk to people like this. Right? And there's, um, I remember reading in social psychology that when talking to boys that are troubled, the best way to talk to boys that are troubled is side to side. So I thought to myself, I said, we always learn that the Prophet would face people. What is this? Now they're coming up with studies that side to side is better for boys that are troubled. So then, a few weeks later, somebody re, uh, reminds me of the hadith of the Prophet when he went to Fatima, his daughter's house, anha, and her husband Ali, anhu, and he sits in between them on their bed because they're struggling with life. <laughs> Fatima is uh, the daughter of the best of mankind, and she's literally carrying, uh, she's... Uh, like uh, grinding wheat for a living. Her husband is carrying buckets of water for a living. They're having a really hard life. So she's asking the Prophet, uh, Ya Rasulullah, she addresses her father, Ya Rasulullah, we could use some help. We could use some help. So he sits in between them on the bed, right? So he's being, like he's shoulder to shoulder. They're in a moment of distress. So at that time, I'm like thinking, wow, the study says with troubled boys, you don't talk to them face to face, you talk to them side to side. So they feel comfortable. 
So subhanAllah, even in this story, we see a side-to-side -side, uh, sitting. He recognizes what's going on. And he says, what, would you rather I give you something better than help? He says, before you go to sleep every night, say subhanAllah 33 times, alhamdulillah 33 times, and Allahu Akbar 33 times. And they took that instead, subhanAllah. And then engaging. So, man, there's so many uh, amazing instances where the Prophet would engage. All right? People would literally test the Prophet ﷺ. They would test him. There was a Jew that lent the Prophet ﷺ money. And this Jew is now radiallahu anhu. I forgot the name of the Sahabi. Man, my memory is not good. But essentially, he came and asked the Prophet for money before the due date. And he came in a very rude way. Because in the Torah, it mentions that the Prophet, the Messiah, would, uh, the Prophet would come. Um, I forgot the exact term, but the Prophet would come. And he would be, uh, have halim and hilm. He would be forbearant, extremely forbearant. When things were done to, bad to him, he would be patient. So he came asking for the money, okay? He came asking for the money early. Sayyidina Umar was so mad, his face turned red. He was ready to kill this man. You're coming to the Prophet, berating him, embarrassing him, yelling at him, asking for your money before the due date? Sayyidina Umar, uh, the Prophet calmed down Umar. He told him to calm down. He said, anybody who's owed something has a right to speak. He told the Sahaba, give this man dates, and whatever amount of money he, he borrowed, um, the Prophet borrowed from him, they paid him back in full at that point. SubhanAllah. And this man, this, uh, this uh, uh, Jewish uh, man, he became a Muslim after that. Radiallahu anhu. Okay. He gave a voice to people. As you're engaging, we engage our kids, our colleagues. Giving them a voice is so important. Even in pedagogy, when we learn to talk to our students, we have our students pick the assignments. We have them pick the topic. We let them do group work and collaborate. The Prophet oftentimes, he asked Salman ibn Farsi, what should we do in this, uh, in this war? He said, Ya Rasulullah, we, let's build a trench. We're outnumbered, let's build a trench. Right? He, he asked Musa ibn Umar, what should we do in Uhud? He gave the Sahaba responsibility. He gave them, uh, he empowered them. He gave them diplomacy. He gave them all of these things that make them feel important. This is also part of building connections. And when he would go, he would approach a leader, he would let that leader keep his status as long as he was under the guidelines of Islam and under the leadership of the Prophet ﷺ. He honored the status of people. He didn't bring them down after conquering, right? ﷺ. And then there is a criticism that often, um, even some of the Sahaba were frustrated at times. The Prophet was just very merciful. They couldn't understand it sometimes, how merciful the Prophet was to the point where they would tell him, Ya Rasulullah, you know the hypocrites amongst us. What did our Prophet say? He said, I don't want to be known as a person that kills his own people. I don't want to be known as a person that kills his own people, even though he knew who the hypocrites were. SubhanAllah. And every situation, there's discernment. So it's your job and your responsibility to see when should you be stern. Because trust me, the Prophet ﷺ, I know he is a mercy to all mankind. Sometimes that mercy requires justice. So yes, there were uh, at times executions. Yes, there was at times he would scold the Sahaba. But there's a way to go about it. And just from my own life experience and just reading some studies about this, you know, when my coach, for instance, in wrestling, he would often get mad at us. Okay? I... Loved it when he would get mad at me. Because I was secure in my position on the team. I was a captain. When he would get mad at me, I knew it came from a place of love. He had built that connection with me. And so this is a lesson. Our prophet, with certain people, he would say certain things. With certain people, he would be more stern. With others, he would show complete benevolence and mercy. Right? And some of my teammates, when the coach would yell at him, they would quit the team. Or they would start backbiting. Or they would do all kinds of things. They would start rebelling. And so even with our own kids, we have to see our, our kids that have different personalities. Like one of my daughters, uh, I won't say who, because they might see this. I won't say who. She has a hard time saying sorry. And you can threaten her with like, no screen time. You're not going to uh, B.B. John's house. You're not doing anything. You can threaten her with everything. She won't say it. Right? My other daughter, you threaten her just a little thing, she'll say it. Sorry. But her sorry is not very sincere. She says sorry. But 
Why well, learn? If you give the, the, the one that doesn't say sorry, if you give her some time, minute, two minutes, she comes back, I love you, I'm sorry. So this is individual discernment that we have to, this is ijtihad, right? As our scholars say, this, this individual ijtihad, where you have to know when's the right time to be stern, but remember the default is always mercy, benevolence, love, kindness. That is the, the overall default. Because when we get older, our kids become less attached to us. Right? I've worked with so many parents that say, Brother Hasib, please talk to my teenager. Um, and you know, I, sometimes it surprises me. Like I remember this, like, just the epitome of a great student, this uh, girl that was in my class, just the most nice and kind and smart and hardworking person. And the father came to me and said, Brother Hasib, please talk to her. Tell her to be kind. Tell her to uh, treat her siblings nicer. She's giving us such a hard time. Please. I'm like, are we talking about the same? kid that you dropped off in my class and because this is not the person that I know so subhanAllah it kind of like taught me a lesson that day like sometimes uh, we act differently away from home than we are at home and even for us as adults like it's very easy to be, to be nice to Adam we barely see each other when we see each other we remember we reminisce and talk about old, old times but with my own kids I see them every day and so kind of our threshold for mercy and kindness gets low and that's sometimes with the people we love the most our mercy is the least. And it's out of love, we want the best for them, but that's a personal struggle I have. I know it's sometimes we all go through this struggle, but we have to be following the Sunnah of the Prophet. The best of you, the best among you, are the best to his or her family. Okay, and then finally, I think this is a truth. This is a truth because this happened during the time of the Prophet wasallam. Even though he was Sadiq, in, uh, sadiq al-Ameen, he was Rahmatul lil alameen the most kind, he was guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not everybody accepted the Prophet Even if you see the stories of the Anbiya, like uh, Sayyidina Nuh, his son, didn't get on the ship. Right? Like Lut, his wife turned away from him. So sometimes, you know, you cannot connect with everybody. And I had to learn this the hard way even as a teacher. Like, I tried so hard. Like, my ultimate goal was to get everybody to like me, which is also a mistake. You know, that's not shouldn't be your main purpose, to get everybody to like you. And so it would hurt me so much when I couldn't connect with certain students. But then I had to learn that you can't always connect with everybody, right? You can't always connect with everybody. Okay, I think we're coming up on our last slide. I think the moral or the ultimate uh, lesson that we should learn from this uh, reminder for myself, first and foremost, is stay connected because that increases your sphere of influence. And ultimately, we are an ummah that sent out uh, to do good. يَأْمَرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And join in goodness. وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ And to negate evil. So we want our influence on our kids, especially with all the other influences out there today. We want to have the biggest influence. Or if we as parents begin to lose influence, because there is a period where like, our kids start to break away from us, and it hurts. Right? We find people that we can bring into their lives that will be a positive impact on them. Right? We, we take them to halaqat, we take them to mentors and youth halaqas and to the masjid or to other Muslims where they say connected. So there's going to be ebbs and flows, but try your best. And if you remember that the default is always the way Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did things, and there's countless examples in his seerah, inshallah, we can come back and talk about those examples one day. But this is the, is the ultimate lesson for today. Remember the default is mercy and try to stay connected before you correct. And I'll end with this story. Right? Hassan and Hussein, they, radiallahu anhum, huma, they, they were the nephew, the grandchildren of the Prophet wasallam. And they saw a man, an older gentleman, making wudu incorrectly. So Hassan and Hussein said, oh, tell him. No, you tell him. Fix his wudu. This guy's making it incorrectly. So they came up with a plan. They said, we don't have any connection with this old man. We don't have a connection. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, Hussein, you go make wudu incorrectly in front of him and I'll come correct you. And this man will learn from you. So they devised a strategy to not hurt the man's ego and pride and maybe he would have felt a certain type of way, an old man getting taught by younger, younger people, even though they were, had such a high status. So they taught the old man through a strategy because they didn't have that connection. So remember, without the connection, we're going to have to spend a lot of energy 
going left and right and trying not to hurt people's feelings and it's, it's a lot of, a lot of, either way, you're going to have some struggle. So it's better to stay connected with people, especially people that are in your life, your family. Silat al-Raham, the Prophet mentioned that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we should um, enjoin ties of family and kinship to the best of our ability, right, as long as they're good influences. So may, subhan may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a means where we can actually implement some of the things we learned today. And if there's any questions, I'll take some questions. If not, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Any questions or anything? Any comments? No, anything? <laughs> Good to see you, by the way. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Brother Khalid, Brother Mansoor. We have some questions on Okay, sure. And I can share this, uh, by the way, I can share this presentation with the community if you guys want, inshallah. Yeah, sure, I can take the question. You wanna take that? Oh, I'll go hand me that, please. Let's see. What do we got here? How do we know when to back off when connecting with kids? SubhanAllah. This takes individual discernment. Ev <laughs> there, I don't think there's um, a good answer to that, or one, or at least I can't come up with a good answer to that. I think the reaction of the child will let you know. You know, how do we know when to back off? And like I said, re, you need to outsource. I, like I tell my, a lot of my parents this, is put your child in a situation where they're getting their influence from somebody you trust. So that requires work on your end, whether that's going to like these organizations like Tawaso that work with youth or whatever the case may be, or going to like a youth halaqa, you know, at the local masjid or find somebody that's a mentor your child can connect with. Because oftentimes, um, and I remember as a teenager, and I uh, have so many regrets as a te teenager in my interaction with people, I, I wish I didn't have that kind of harshness towards my own parents. I had that like American teenage, oh, like I, I didn't do anything crazy, but like I didn't understand the haq that my parents had, because nobody taught me at that point. You know, there weren't a lot of these, um, uh, all these Islamic edu uh, educational opportunities that we have now, uh, at my time, nobody really taught it to me, so it wasn't in my heart. I mean, I knew I had to respect my parents, but I had that uh, like American attitude, like a, a culture of disrespect. Well, like, why are you asking me about my school? Like, I'm, do I'm okay. But, you know, so I've, I remember how ignorant I was at that time. So I can empathize with it a little bit more. And sometimes kids just need space, you know. But that takes some individual discernment, and I don't have a good answer for that question. Uh, you know your child best, and I would say the biggest advice is to outsource for that. I think we have another question. Since you are a parent, what would you say is the best way for a child to connect with parents? Uh, I heard a, a really good advice one time. Children spell love, T-I-M-E. Children spell love, T-I-M-E. You get what that means? Does that make sense? No? They, they, equiv they, they equate your love with the time you spend with them, right? So like, I know we're busy at work, we have all these errands and chores and things we have to do. Involve them in your chores, involve them in your errands. You know, you're listening to a podcast about Palestine and Israel, but your child is like trying to see what's going on. Put the phone down. <laughs> I'm talking about my own personal life right now. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Sometimes it's hard to go away from sending that email or you have a conversation with your spouse and the moment you start the conversation, your kids barge in and want to ask you 20,000 questions. So time, it's about time, it's about uh, quality time, you know, it's about getting on their eye level, being genuinely interested in what they have to say. They have a lot to say sometimes. So I think that's a, how I usually um, ask or uh, connect. Why are our kids turning out poorly despite using new strategies to be understanding with them when in the past more straightforward methods were effective? That's, uh, once again, these are, these are questions for experts. I can only give you from my own personal experience and some things that I read. Why are kids turning out poorly despite using new strategies? Uh, I think, um, as Leonard Sachs mentions in his books, that uh, America has a culture of disrespect. He said North America in particular, Canada, Mexico, America, um, there's a lot of disrespectful aspects. And a lot of the things that make American culture stand out and exceptional which is like our creativity, sometimes our rebellion, going against the grain. Sometimes being in this uh, sphere of influence can also have a negative effect with the amount of respect and, um, and goodness that we show 
uh, our elders. And so I think that could be it. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of enemies around us, meaning shaitan, uh, the dunya, our own desires, our nafs sometimes it gets the best of us. So I think there are more things going against us because we're kind of going, swimming uh, up the river. We're kind of swimming up the river in these kind of societies. And now American influence has spread all across the globe. So even in Islamic countries, you see some of this spreading into those areas as well. So I think that's one of the things that, I, that I've seen. And ultimately, man, I, I, Allah guides. Because I didn't have a practicing family growing up. And I kind of found my love of Islam in college. And I know families that uh, were very mutadayyan and they were very on their deen and they had their kids in the madrasa and maktab and hif. But sometimes they don't, the kids, uh, uh, the guidance isn't there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides who He wills. And sometimes that doesn't reach them until maybe a later day or whatever. But uh, I've seen both. Like, uh, like ultimately, it's, in, it's, uh, it's, it's up to Allah, but we, could still have to, we still have to do our best. We still have to do our best. Are you planning to start any classes in Mountain House? I don't know. I talked about the Khalid, Brother Mansoor. Some kids tend to watch TikTok and other related social media, which changes their views. How can we connect with these kids? It's time. You've got to spend time with them. Ultimately, as parents, I know... I know this because parents come to me and say, Brother Hasib, please talk to my son, my, my daughter, whatever in your class, teach him this lesson. So when that happens, I know they're starting to lose that haiba they have for their parents, that like awe that they have for their parents, that uniqueness. And, uh, you know, that happens. I think that's a natural. So because I've seen it so many times, I'm kind of getting ready for my own daughter. Like my oldest daughter is seven. So I usually see around that nine, ten years old, they start to kind of lose like, hey, my dad doesn't know everything. Wait a second. This is opposite than what my teacher said. And uh, I'm getting ready for that uh, mentally because I know that's going to be a hard day for me. But um, it kind of happens, but it's an ebb and flow. Like I, I've seen where the kids go away from their parents. And then I, I'm thinking about somebody specific right now. And now one of my best students, he's like so tight with his dad now. But for a while they weren't talking to each other. This was like his ninth, 10th grade year. Like, it was really bad. It was a really bad relationship. And now they're so tight. So there's ebbs and flows in relationships as well. Uh, when kids are under age of seven, do you recommend more playtime, more teaching? Yeah. Under seven, it's all playtime. Under seven is playtime. Uh, you know, subhanAllah, man. Just me reciting uh, Quran in the car, my kids just pick it up. So... <laughs> Like, I'll be saying something in the Quran and then I'll stop midway and then they'll finish the ayah. I'll be like, Ya yuha ladina amanu sta'inu bis sabri wa. And then my kids go in the back, salah. And then everybody starts laughing. So, play, play, it's a play learning. Everything is play learning. Try not to be too harsh. You know, I remember my own parents, they really wanted us to read at four years old and they really pushed us to do certain things. I, I don't personally align with that philosophy, especially at a younger age. Play, play, play. Um, really spend time uh, with the kid, allow them to make mistakes. And I think this is even in, the, in our Islamic uh, philosophy as well, like the first few years, it's like, um, be merciful. Then the next phase, have more discipline. And then the final phase of their uh, pre, uh, uh, teenage years into adulthood, become friends. There is, a, there is that as well, precedent. How do we know when to back, oh wait. Is eliminating and confiscating technology away from kids like iPads and iPhones? Yeah, I take away as a consequence. I think it's better than spanking. The, Aisha radiallahu anha said that the Prophet never hit anybody from his family, even though other major sahaba, like big sahabi, would physically reprimand their kids. But the Prophet never did it. So we always default back to the Prophet. I think it's better than physical reprimanding, right? Taking away uh, the things that they cherish and value. Because I think there's a good lesson in that. You know, and it has to be done with hikmah. And the kids, here's a big uh, advice. Always have the kids know ahead of time all the expectations and boundaries. Don't fling it on them. And if you fling something onto them, make sure the default is mercy. Because they didn't know those were the rules or the boundaries. They might have had an idea, but if it wasn't clear, as a teacher, they tell you, make sure they know the rules. Not only that, act out what could happen, act something bad out and what could happen as a consequence. To that extent, uh, they tell teachers to act out bad things in class that could potentially happen, what the consequence would be. So that way the kids don't say, I didn't know. Can you share your experience as you tutor HIF students? How do you keep them engaged when they see their friends doing various activities they can't? I don't know, I don't spend all day. With, with, when I'm with my students, typically, I don't see any of the negative things. 
Um, I try to be a good influence and role model, so that's kind of a hard question. I know the parents deal with the brunt of all of the, the whining and kind of maybe the attitude. To me, they come to me usually happy and engaged, and so for me, it's, it's hard for me to say. Like, it's easy for me to be kind to them when they're already kind to me, so that's a hard one for me to answer. Can you share your experience as you tutor HIF students? How do you keep them engaged when they see their friends doing very I mean, I don't know. I try to just be interactive. When I see my kids falling asleep, I try to change the subject. I try to be uh, aware. Let's maybe just do one more question. How do we explain to our elders not to compare the kids to each other on who is on what stage of life? It's hard to explain anything to your elders. It's hard to explain anything to your elders. Really, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'm having a hard time because when we take, uh, I don't know if they're listening, but when we take our, our kids to our grandparents' house, it's, they can have whatever they want. Right? They can do whatever they want. And we're always, the parents are always the bad guys. So I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I think we need to bring on somebody more experienced with that. I, I, I typically just let my parents do what they want to do, honestly, because uh, I don't, it's hard, it's hard. Okay, how do we explain? Okay, that's it. Okay, thank you guys. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashallahu wa la ilaha illa anta nasak Okay, everyone, jazakallah khair.